Wagwan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history from our family and take that moving forward so I do hope you enjoy the podcast and if you like it please ensure to subscribe like and review thank you your uh, the exhibit provisions and how that relates to Caribbean history from a food perspective. So uh, before we start, I'll get you just to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so um, I am a professor of, in the English department at Salem State University. Um, and I research in, in Caribbean literatures and particularly in um, food studies and food writing. So I teach all sorts of classes on um, Caribbean studies and literary studies, and then I write on Caribbean food. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And, you know, we'll start now. And then just to say, you know, what was the motivation that brought this exhibit to life? Could you so, um, yeah, with pleasure. So um, I've been researching Caribbean cookbooks for um, a book project that I was working on. Uh, um, and I was talking about it with my students. And they all got very excited about doing, talking about food and following, using food as a way to think about history and culture. So um, I taught a course and this, um, this exhibit is the product of a course and the course was on um, provisions. And it also was thinking about, you know, making sure that we're making things that are actually accessible to people outside of the academy. And so that's why we made this exhibit. Oh, perfect. That's wonderful. And again, you know, food carries, you know, cultural and historical significance. And how does this exhibit explore this cultural importance? So I think it's important to say I teach at a universe at a college and university um, in New England. And so one of the things is most of the students in this class um, don't have personal backgrounds in the Caribbean, but they have personal backgrounds in New England. And so one of the things about food is that um, there's a lot of food ways that connect us. And so in New England, we think of pumpkins and sweet potatoes um, and yams as being part of our food ways. And so it was really, so part of this is an opportunity to understand whatever your background is, the foods that you eat, once you start understanding the histories of those foods, you realize you're participating in that food tradition in some way. Um, but I think for the other part for cultural significance is, um, you know, food writing comes up in more technical spaces. Um, it comes up in, you know, in histories and in botanies, but it also comes up all over works of literature um, and all over cookbooks. And I really, the students read a lot of cookbooks. I work in cookbooks. And I really think that cookbooks are a place where generally women um, are writing down their food traditions, but they're also writing down their cultural histories, right? And they're naming and formulating um, their cultural histories. No, definitely. I know with researching my family tree, I have found a couple of, you know, recipes on the back of an envelope from, uh, you know, my grandmother, uh, what she's written in it, just to see that handwriting, to see what they formulated for the recipe to make this particular item, which is kind of interesting. So, you know, there is definitely yeah, power and, in the word. Yeah. And which, which words people use, right? You start to understand some of the, some of the histories that they're connected to, right? So, you know, if you use, if you use the word provisions versus if you were use the word hard food, right? That's going to help you understand, does your family history come from, um, you know, from Trinidad or from Jamaica, right? So thinking about the, those words are really um, geographically and culturally located also. So just as you've mentioned, you know, what is provisions, first of all, and go ahead. So, um, so provisions is, um, it's a set of foods. Sometimes people say that they're root vegetables, but they're not all root vegetables. So it's a set of starchy foods um, that includes yam, um, cassava, um, pumpkin, 
all of the root vegetables um, that go along with that and plantain. Mm -hmm. um, and the word, the reason that they're called provisions comes from um, the history of slavery in the Caribbean. So um, slaves were um, not fed enough food and then there started to be regulations um, about giving slaves enough food. And one of the ways that plantation owners got around actually giving their slaves enough food was that they would give them um, grounds, a space to plant some of their own food. Um, and those were called provision grounds. Yes. Um, and they were generally located relatively far from the plantations um, off of the good soil. Um, and so you had to grow foods there that didn't need a lot of tending um, and that didn't need to be harvested the second they got ripe. Um, and so, um, and so what are those foods? Pumpkins, cassava, um, yams, sweet potatoes, right? Um, all of those root vegetables. Um, be, slaves were often only allowed to go um, and tend them about once a week. Um, and so, and at the same time, because this isn't, it isn't only a story of deficit, um, folks knew what were the very nutritious foods. Cassava and yams and pumpkins are very nutritious foods. Um, plantain is a very nutritious food. And so they were also planting foods that had high nutritional value um, for the time and energy um, that they took. So from provision grounds, you get ground provisions and then that get short, gets shortened to provisions, um, but it is also hard, hard food in some places. It's just called food in some places. Um, in the um, Hispanophone Caribbean, it's called um, biandas or biberes with a V. Um, in Haiti, it's called bivre. So um, there's, and those relate to um, life and living, um, right? And biandas relates to meat, but it's like as a staple food. Um, but generally the word provisions is in the English speaking um, Caribbean and diaspora, kind of the, the shorthand. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. The, the words that are used, uh, as you just said, you know, especially in Haiti, viva, meaning life, but wow, it's just, it's just amazing. So, and then of course, I guess with provisions, you know, why did you use it in the exhibit time? Um, so uh, there's partly, I'm just going to say, I was really inspired by this cookbook, um, right? So I think um, I had been reading this cookbook, um, Michelle and Suzanne Russo's Provisions, The Roots yes. of Caribbean Cooking. Um, and it's a it's a really compelling cookbook that starts to trace some of those histories. And I wanted more of the histories. Um, but also, I think the word provisions, it points to, even though it comes from provision grounds, which is the history of slavery, it points to folks who turned that around and said, we're providing, right? It's the idea of providing, giving sustenance. Um, and it's a really welcoming and powerful word. Definitely it is. And so with the person's ex exhibit, it's online. So are there any, you know, interactive elements or activities that the audience can engage with to understand the concept of provisions and the history of these food types? So um, it's a series of exhibits, each focused around either a particular provision or a particular aspect of a provision. And then as you go into them, there are timelines, um, there are story maps. So it is mostly, um, it, it's reading, but there's a bunch and, and viewing, but there are all these different ways to um, go through the timelines and the story maps um, and the images and the texts and kind of pick one um, and, and dig into it or go through all of them together and see um, the, the kind of circle that they create. Perfect. And would you be able to just kind of show that to us just so people can get an, an idea and they can just kind of go through With it after pleasure. Like yes. I always put that in the show notes as well. So this yes. is what they're so going to see. Perfect. This is, so this is the front page. Um, and then if you go down, I'm going to show you the first one, the Botanical History of Yams in the Caribbean, um, which has some um, text, right? Some explanation of what is yams. Um, and then, um, right, this sort of looking at, right? So these images with explanation of um, the images. And then I'm going to go um, back and show you another exhibit that has um, more of um, some other 
version. So this one is a story map. So mm -hmm. this is a, um, a map and you can either click through it um, to look at the different pieces or you can click on um, a part of the image and move through. Um, so all of these have um, some combination of, of maps um, and historical images and then some explanatory um, text. Yeah, which is great because then you get to see what's, what's happening for the Caribbean. Not, and of course, how the different islands kind of connect. I'm sure that they have different names for the same item as well. Because uh, I think that uh, mentioned that as well, which is fantastic to, to see that all in one place. So, because um, as well, talking about language. So the exhibit does explore the relationship between language and foods and its connection to the continent of Africa. Would you be able to speak to some of the examples of this? Yeah, so um, one of the ways really comes in um, with looking at um, the histories of these foods. So um, yam is a really good example. Um, the word yam comes from um, uh, West African languages, nyame. Um, is probably closer to um, West African pronunciations. And I'm I'm saying West African in general, in part because of the way that the slave trade um, mixed people up, but also because um, West African languages, while they are distinct, are part of the same language group. And so those, those root words, um, as they translate into um, words in the Caribbean, um, they're the same root words in most West African um, languages. So yam is a really good one. Um, fufu. Um, is another really good one, right? So the word fufu um, means uh, pounding. It's a word for a particular um, technique. So if you if you pound something and then make it into a mash by pounding it and then reform it, that's the that's the verb. Fufu is the pounding to met to a mash so that you can reform it. Um, and the word cuckoo, which is um, in Barbados, also comes from that same. It's just a it's just a shift from fufu. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that some of the times you can hear um, in West African languages, fufu, the accent is on the U part. Um, so there's a lot of, in a lot of West African languages, there's an accent. If there's a multi-syllable word, the accent is on the end of the word. So if you hear a word that has the accent there, you can start to think, oh, that probably has a West African origin. Um, like okra is doesn't have a West African origin, but kimbombo, which is what it's called um, in the Dominican republics, in Cuba, mostly in Cuba, that's that's just a West African word, um, kimbombo. So um, so as you know, once if you sort of trace the words around different parts of the Caribbean, sometimes you find like, oh, that's the that's the West African root for that um, word, um, and um, all of the plantain-based foods. Um, plantain is a is not a West African word, but once you start getting into the foods themselves, a lot of those foods um, have um, West African roots. And um, in Dominican Republic, the like one of the main central dishes is called mangu, and that comes from a West African word mangusi, um, which is um, again a plantain preparation. Yeah, it just as I said, I just find all of this very really fascinating. And I mean, growing up. It's just hearing the conversations of my mother's friends and them saying, oh, we call this this in this island and we call it this in this island. And it's they're describing the exact same food type. So uh, it just having that connection, right? So for that particular period. Now for the, again, continuing on the food types mentioned and featured in the exhibit, most are staples and favorites and provide a history with a connection of slavery and native populations. Would you be able to speak to uh, some examples such as like pumpkin and squash? Yeah, so this is a really rich one um, because um, pumpkin is indigenous to the Americas. Um, and so this is, but other squashes are indigenous to Africa. Um, and so this is one of the things that happened, one of the ways that you get um, what some people call Afro-Indigenous foods um, comes from that combination where you have Indigenous folks in the Caribbean who are making these preparations. Um, folks are forced um, from Africa to the Caribbean and they find recognition in the foods that they already 
are making mm -hmm. and in the preparations that they already are using. And so I think pumpkin and pumpkin soup in particular becomes such an important staple across the Caribbean because it is something where um, folks with um, either directly from or descendants from Africa um, understand that food. And then it's also an indigenous food um, in the Caribbean. But that word, the, the words for pumpkin are really rich, right? So it's called pumpkin in English. And that's from um, the Arab word for um, melon. And that's because when um, colonists brought very early on, they brought pumpkins back to Europe. And they didn't have a word for that because it didn't exist. Um, but it looks kind of like a melon. And so they called it um, words for melon. And so that's why um, pumpkin is described as melon. But in some of the early colonial cookbooks, um, there are some recipes for pumpkin soup that say you can use melon instead, um, which you can't, right? Like that would be a terrible <laughs> idea, but it's because these are written by people who didn't, they were written by colonists. They didn't actually know the foods they were writing about. And so they make this language, you know, confusion. Um, but in Haiti, um, the word for pumpkin is jumu or jumus, uh, and that comes from a Tupi word, which is an indigenous language um, in what's now Brazil. So you see that connection um, in um, the Dominican Republic. It's called Aoyama, which is an Arawakan word that's also still used in Colombia. Um, so you see these, you see the the indigeneity of that food through um, these these words, and then you just see the technique, right? So the technique of um, of mashing and boiling, right? Um, is a technique that, um, first of all, is a technique that was widely used um, by indigenous people in the Caribbean, um, and um, right, and this, and there's beautiful um, uh, ceramic pots um, and a tradition of ceramic pots that are still used. And then, of course, as folks are coming from Africa, they come with the tradition of of iron pots, um, and so they they bring the iron pot. Um, and the and the knowledge of how to make iron pots with them. And so then you get this soup that is made again um, through these Afro-Indigenous traditions. And then you get the add-ins, right? Then sometimes people put salt pork um, or salt beef into their pumpkin soup, again, sort of through the legacy of, of slavery and the ways in which salt pork and salt beef were um, part of, um, of slave food traditions. Very, it's a very rich history and to know how it all kind of connects. And so why was it important for the, in the exhibit to show the archeological and origins of these traditions? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think part of it is that the trajectories of these foods are in many ways, the trajectories of creolization in the Caribbean, right? And so on the one hand, the food histories allow us to trace back to some of those further um, um, ancestries and histories. And at the same time, the foods that are made with them in the Caribbean, those are Creole foods. And those are the result of all of those different histories coming together in the Caribbean. And there's lots of European ancestry in that food too, right? This, mm -hmm. this isn't only indigenous and African ancestries in the food. It's the ways in which in the Caribbean, the Creole brings all of those together and it brings Asian food traditions together also, right? Both um, both Indo-Caribbean um, and, um, and Sino-Caribbean. Um, and there's some, the use of, of all the, um, the onion, um, pepper, right? Um, those traditions, those probably come from Sephardic Jewish traditions um, that were part of that um, diaspora into the Caribbean. And so I think when we look at the individual histories and they're coming together, we really get a deep understanding of how Caribbean culture is, comes about through Creolization and is Creole culture. Definitely, yeah, all of those mixing together. And so, you know, when most people think about food, it usually invokes, you know, warm and fond memories and the connection to a period of time that was nice to have and it real, and it, and it, this was revealed in the exhibit. And, was this the intent behind um, to have this portrayed in the exhibit? Would you yeah, it, it really was. And, and you know, um, the 
the students who created the exhibit and I, we talked a lot about how we're investigating some pretty painful histories. And we are looking at the ways in which individual people and communities and cultures have survived and sustained and created beautiful and delicious things in spite of those the, the painfulness of those histories. And so to focus on these foods are delicious, they're nutritious, they are incredible ways and, and, and the process of making them and eating them brings people together, right? Um, and it's really important um, for me, and I think it was really important for the students to not just think about, oh, if we're thinking about curbing history and the history of foods, then we're, then we're stuck in the pain. The pain is really there. It can't be denied, but it's, it's leads to, and, and has now, you know, been taken into um, spaces of celebration um, and beauty. Mm -hmm, definitely. And so with cuisine, you know, it's, it's an integral part of the culture. How does Caribbean cuisine with its diverse flavors and ingredients influence, how does this influence the exhibit and the message being presented? Yeah, so I think, you know, as as you follow those histories, I think part of it is um, you may start out thinking whether you're a student or whether you're looking into your own history and thinking, in my past, I'm going to uncover my, you know, West African roots or I'm going to uncover my indigenous roots. And part of what I think most people end up uncovering is the multiplicity of those roots, right? Um, and so as you follow, you know, if you follow the cookbooks that were on your mother's shelf, even if she didn't use them, for some reason, she might have had some cookbooks, right? Um, if you follow the, um, the notes that your grandmother might have written down or that your auntie might have written down um, when she was listening to your grandmother, right? If you look at those, um, what you end up finding is these personal histories, these cultural histories, right? So you talk to other people and you're like, wait, you, you make that too. And you make it a little differently, right? So you, it's this space where you can really trace out um, the, um, a lot, like Edward Vison is a famous Caribbean theorist and he talks about how the Caribbean is both a unified place and everything comes from someplace else. And in the food, you see that, right? There are distinct family cultures. There are distinct national cultures. Um, there are distinct pan-Caribbean cultures and each one has its own set of histories and combinations. Definitely, it's, it's as you said, it's the different, but yet the same. And that is the connection. Food seems to be the connection to bring all of that together. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please make sure to like, follow, um, subscribe, so I, I really and write a review the for the episode this, wherever um, you listen exhibit. to your um, podcast. So Thank you. It was a group of students, and their names are are um, on the um, on the exhibit by each of their exhibits. But they did an incredible um, work of gathering and presenting this. Um, and I also want to say, um, I do, um, I have a book on this topic. It's called Culinary Colonialism, Caribbean Cookbooks and Recipes for National Culture. And it um, will be on shelves in February. So coming soon. Perfect. And I'll make sure to include that in the show notes so people can be able to see that. But again, I wanted to thank you, Professor Verlance, for coming on to the podcast and to speak about the provisions exhibit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.